we are now about to introduce our panel for this next session. Um, and I welcome Louise Tarrant, David Ritter and Sam McLean to the stage. So Louise Tarrant, uh, a lifelong unionist who is now the National Secretary of United Voice, one of Australia's largest unions, representing workers in diverse industries, childcare, hospitality, aged care and security. Louise is passionate about the issues that affect her members, such as low pay, insecurity and lack of respect at work. I know her as a wonderful uh, operator and uh, we welcome her to the panel. Thanks. David Ritter at the very end is the Chief Executive Officer of Greenpeace Australia Pacific. Uh, David returned to Australia to take up this role in August last year after five years working in a senior campaigns position with Greenpeace in London. A former lawyer and academic, wow that's a scary combination, and uh, obviously a great activist. David is a widely published political commentator and welcome to David. And Sam McLean in the middle is, a is the National Director of Get Up, Australia's leading community campaigning organisation, more than 600,000 online members. Sam has worked for Get Up for five years, spearheading key campaigns on issues such as mental health, renewable energy, human rights, pokies reform and international aid. What a great panel. So we, our first is this tradition with the conference starting with our, uh, our safe forum questions and there are three questions that have been voted on for this part of the section and the first question that we're going to ask of Jeremy, in fact all three are asked of Jeremy, is from Kevin Rennie who I'd really like to stand up because Kevin has had the number one question in every session. <laughs> So we have to say, he obviously knows how to write the right questions or ask the right questions. And I thought he was here. He is right. over here. Where is he? Here. There. <laughs> so Kevin's question is to Jeremy, how can brick by brick organising be utilised to recast Australia's attitudes to asylum seekers? Um, so I did, I did take a look at the questions um, beforehand. Uh, what a great hour say. Good say. Um, your say. Our say. Our say. Okay. Um, so I, I think, um, and I think the other panelists can probably talk about this as, as much as, as I can. Um, I don't want to equate you know, the, uh, the Australian you know, situation, you know, exactly to the to the states, but um, you know, obviously the, the asylum seeker issue here very similar to. You know, in some ways similar to what we're dealing with with immigration reform uh, in, in the United States. And um, I, I share the same optimism that was shared yesterday about um, our ability to actually get legislation passed um, on immigration reform in the United States. And I know it's crazy to have any optimism about anything getting passed in our Congress, but um, I think for, for me, what we've seen in, in and how, and it was a lot about the messaging stuff that was talked about yesterday in terms of how the immigration debate has been shifted um, through a different narrative that's, I think, much more positive and much more effective. But it's also been, I think, a lot about stories. And we've worked with a lot of groups like PICO in the States is a, is a faith-based group, very, very community-based, faith-based group. And um, they, their ability to have stories of, uh, of folks in front and center you know, there's too often we have this kind of dialogue that is, if we just say the right things because, you know, the polls agree with us, um, somehow we'll be able to get our elected leaders and sort of, you know, create real change. When in fact, it's a lot of it is about this narrative and about stories and being able to have this folks be front and center in terms of our debate. You know, there, there, there's, there's a lot of similarities in the sense that, you know, there's a reason that people are wanting to come to Australia. There's a reason that people are wanting to come um, to the States and that's something we should highlight as a positive piece and this should be something I think with the narrative that's that's very positive so I think in terms of uh, 
the organizing part of it, it's that we have these groups that actually know these folks, that have been organizing in immigrant communities in the United States for a long time, who are bringing those voices to the, to the top. Those folks are the ones that are talking to their legislatures. Those folks are talking about the families that would be um, you know, split apart. Those folks are talking about why they want, you know, what their, their contributions to, to our society. And I think there's a lot to learn from that kind of nitty gritty organizing where we have those relationships and we're able to have those, you know, it, it's not like we had to build that overnight. People have been doing that work in the community for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, I think just generally, when you're trying to get push an issue that isn't going to happen overnight, the question is what's the long-term strategy and how do you build the organizing capability to do that? And I assume there's a lot of great groups here that are that are doing that work. The question is are you doing it together as a group? And we've had that problem in the states often where we have, you know, 10 groups working on immigration reform uh, and everybody wants to be in charge. And I think we've done a much better job this time of coming together and saying, yeah, it's not about any of our one groups. It's about ultimately moving public opinion on this and ultimately getting a bill passed that will change the lives of millions of people. Uh, that comes from stories, it comes from real organizing on the ground, it comes from a legislative strategy, a theory of change that makes sense, and then utilizing all the other uh, tools in our arsenal to, to get our message out to as many people as possible. I okay, hope that's helpful. Thank you. So question number two is, uh, do you think you are more like a real life Josh Lyman or Toby Ziegler? <laughs> The West Wing, the West Wing, the West Wing. Well, I'm just glad that the question is, am I more like Frank Underwood or <laughs> or um, or Walter White or something like that? So that that's a, that's good. Um, definitely more like Josh Lyon. I mean, <laughs> right? Um, no, I mean Toby. Toby in West Wing is the kind of communications guy. He's also a little bit dark, um, and, and and Josh is the kind of you know deputy. Um, Chief of Staff and, and Jim Messina, who was our campaign manager, had his role and liked to talk about how he was basically the real life Josh Lyman. Um, but, you know, like he was a strategist and, and a political person, and he was also a little bit in your face, which I like. So, I, I think we've got the message about staying in your face. Yeah. I think that's good. Okay, and question number three from the Our Safe Forum is When does big data analytics of the population? thus the potential manipulation of voters start to erode the ideals of democracy? Yeah, this is a good question and one that I get uh, a lot, um, particularly at progressive conferences. Um, and I, I was actually, I, I spoke at the Personal Democracy Forum last year on the same day that the NSA stuff happened, so I was talking about that on the campaign, also bad job. I mean, that was like not a good straw that I drew that day. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that it's a good question to ask, and I think we need to be very um, careful and, and transparent about our use of, of, of data and, and, and sort of, it can go in, in the wrong direction, um, and so there needs to be a lot of protection put in place. Um, but I think the way that, that we use data on the campaign, and, and it, I think sometimes gets a little bit overblown, but essentially what we did is this. In, in the States, you have a voter file of all 300 million people, you know, 200 plus million people in each state, and on that file we know, you know people, who, their registration information, you know, their name, uh, in many cases their phone number, their address, and we know, which, um, you know, we need this because we don't have compulsory voting if they voted before, not who they voted for, if they voted before. And that information is public, you know, information. Um, the most rich data that we had, though, that we used in the campaign, people talk a lot about Oh, we, we, which you can't do here, I, I, I understand. We would buy data on consumer information on what kind of magazines or car or whatever. And everybody writes about that, like it's, it, that's just not what happened. Um, yes, we have that information, that information, but if I knew that a voter in Ohio drove a Prius, um, that's great, but I already knew that they were a Democrat and they lived in a democratic area, and they were younger, like all the just basic characteristics we knew about people that's sort of public on our voter file is what you really needed to know. And more importantly, the data that we were getting was our conversations with people, face to face. So if I talked to somebody in Ohio in 2010 in our worst election cycle, and they told us they were gonna be voting for the Democratic uh, gubernatorial candidate, that was a bigger predictor of their likelihood to vote for Barack Obama in 2012 than any data that I could sort of buy out there and sort of apply to folks. So I think you have to have protections on it. But I don't I think it can be used actually as a, as a good thing for democracy in the sense that what I was trying to do with our volunteers, right, was to give them the most effective list possible to go have conversations with voters. 
and to help rank order for them who are the most likely to be persuadable based on all of our data analytics, and then go out and have those conversations. In and of itself, you know, people think it's like a predictor of the future that we can't change. That I'll just sit here and do this data analytics and that'll tell us what's going to happen in the election. If that's how it was, then none of us would need to be here. We actually believe in changing uh, some of those predictions when needed or make, you know, making it better when it, when it looks good. So I think you've got to be careful about it. I think you've got to be smart about it. I think like, you, know, you need to be very clear with your online data you know, protections and be very transparent with people about what you will share and won't share and people are signing up on their own volition. And then I think the real rich data comes from conversations that we have with folks. And our ability to keep that in our database is, I think, a good thing because too often we rely on a really good organizer in an area to build up these relationships with folks, but then they move on. And then we go back and start all over again. And we were rebuilding from them, as opposed to having that information that people have given us um, to be able to start that conversation from where it left off. Um, and I think that that can be used for, uh, to, to strengthen some small D democracy, to get more people engaged in the process, as opposed to um, as opposed to you know, what some people are afraid that it might do. So thank you, Jeff, for contributing to our questions. So we now have our panel here sitting so quietly, but there might be comments that they might like to make on each of those questions or, or not. Toby Sinclair and Josh Mike. Um, I, I mean, I think on the, on the last question there about, about data, I think that's something that Australians have a very different attitude to Americans about and on the whole. Um, and it, it's something that um, a lot of Australians get very nervous about. Um, but when, when, we're using, um, when we're using data to have conversations with people at a local level who we know are um, undecided or, or about the issues that we know they care about, um, to me that's enhancing um, the ideals of democracy. That's, that's about um, respecting um, the power of somebody's vote, respecting um, how important they are, and having a conversation with them about um, the things that matter to them. So uh, I think that we we often um, let out let our first reaction of, of respect for privacy override um, uh, the deep motive behind um, using that data, which is respect for people's vote and their power. And as an enabling tool, sort of, yeah, giving people what they want. So we have some questions now to the edge of the panels, but certainly first to Louise, that um, the grassroots approach to organising and creating change and building long-term power through community is not new for the union movement. Tell us about your experiences. Well, it's part of our DNA in a way. I mean, if you go back historically to the beginning of unions, it's always been about grassroots organising, it's always been about building power and for positive social change. But I certainly think in the Australian context, in the 1990s, I think, we saw a big sea change in how we operate. Um, we saw neoliberalism starting to really bite, and so for our members, um, work started to really change. Um, employers started to be much more militant, we saw a lot more outsourcing, we saw jobs being casualised. Um, a really significant shift in um, the quality of jobs available. And the employers became much more militant against unionism, uh, and the conservative side of politics really came in and legislated hard. So we were losing institutional power on, on every level, and our members' lives were unfortunately starting to go backwards. And so we really needed to rethink how do we rebuild power. And so grassroots organising was the logical outcome when you're locked out of workplaces and you're locked out of the court system. And you know, like it actually drives you to actually knock on doors and have conversations and meet in cafes. And I, I think though it's important to say, and so we've certainly learned and shared a lot from the US experience because unfortunately workers have been facing these um, attacks, uh, you know, a lot harsher than ours, although we're learning pretty quickly. Um, but I think the thing about it is uh, it's been, I think, a real positive born out of a negative. It's been very liberating for us as unions. It's given workers a much greater voice. We've seen workers much more assertive and take more control and leadership in their own organisations. And this conference, I think, has been really interesting in terms of pushing us to now think about how we bring the digital into that face-to-face um, -face organising. So I actually think it's a real positive, but it's born out a challenge and it's still a significant sign. Absolutely. And Sam, certainly for you, that's what GetUp is based on, the whole community organising. So how have you applied, I guess, the online and the offline together? 
I would differentiate. I would say that the GetUp has not, um, or has not been based on community organizing as much as mobilizing. I think that's a distinction that Jeremy made um, in that speech, which, which is important, um, between, um, between mobilizing people on an, on an issue or a cause, which involves driving them to action, and organizing um, communities, which involves consulting them um, about um, what's going on for them and building local connections. Um, and I think that um, organizing has been um, something that we have uh, approached, but but, um, but has not been kind of our core model. It's been about uh, mobilizing. Um, and I think that, um, that Louise is right to say that the union movement have um, have really owned um, the organizing space in Australia for um, and, and developed so much of, of the infrastructure and the knowledge um, that underlies that in Australia. For for our part, I think the challenge is um, what uh, it's been that Jeremy identified in doing the, the mobilizing and the, the huge number of people engaged at a fairly shallow level and combining that with the, the deep um, organizing connections as well. Um, so Rebecca Wilson is on our team as one of the um, one of the many Australians who uh, worked on um, the campaigns Jeremy was talking about in the States and, and one of the things that she brought back to us was this model of, of camps where our members get together and uh, we provide training in how to tell their stories and personal narrative, um, how to explain um, their personal journey in a way that resonates with, um, with uh, a campaign. Um, so that's been you know, one, one piece that I think takes us further down um, that, that inverted pyramid. Um, and Carl and our team um, during the last election, I think, um, took us an, another layer um, down by using kind of a uh, snowflake um, model to, to organize 6,000 get members to be volunteering on polling booths, um, having conversations with voters um, on election day, um, coordinated by you know, a layer above that of, of uh, several hundred um, volunteer coordinators coordinated by more, another layer of volunteer coordinators coordinated by staff coordinated by um, a small team of just four or five staff in our office. I think that's the, the, the direction, um, but Jeremy's um, challenge that he laid out in that presentation, um, the challenge of combining, mobilizing and organizing is something that um, I take to heart, I think, is before us. And Jeremy, outside of political elections, or the election campaigning, what have you, how have you seen this within other groups in the US? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and just real quick on the, um, on the point about the, the training and the, we called them Camp Obamas in, in 2008 and, um, and then some of those that they're getting in 2012 um, where he's getting at it. I think the, the, the big difference when I talked about those folks who were volunteers going out and talking to people at, at the doors, one of the big things, and this came from a lot of Marshall Gaines' theory, uh, but is that we felt like we were always giving them, like, we were always trying to win the argument as opposed to win it on based on values. You know, um, and, and so getting at the core of people's personal narrative of why they're there, why they're supporting your cause, your issue, your candidate, and having them um, tell it more from the heart, more, more like, you know, more of a story that also has, you know, a reason uh, and puts the choice in front of people in, in terms of an election, uh, was a kind of really critical and under-told story about the difference in how we were training volunteers to have a conversation with voters. Um, and and we, moved, we, we know we were moving people, we were tracking it very closely, who were undecided because of these conversations with people that they could really connect with. Um, the way we've seen it in terms of uh, your question about outside of, of politics, so uh, I started a firm called 270 Strategies after the campaign. We are um, the, the uh, department on the campaign that I worked on was called 270, it was the number of electoral votes we needed to win. So. That's what we call it that. And um, we want to help people hit their goals and we want to help people build uh, campaigns. And we've seen it all sorts of places. I, I actually, the session after this, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of them. But you know, everything from, we, we helped work with um, a very small group called Scouts for Equality, which was a very, very low-funded uh, nonprofit group that was trying to get the Boy Scouts of America to allow gay scouts. Um, we won uh, earlier this year. And we got a lot of work to do to get them to completely uh, understand equality. But, um, but we, we moved them. Uh, some, and it was using the same tactics. They knew, they looked at it, they knew the way to win was to go get the number of uh, delegates they needed that were going to this convention to get them to vote. And so they built local teams in where those delegates were, they targeted them, they had conversations with them, they pushed them, and then we used a delegate tracker that we used in the primary from 2008 to kind of track that. Um, so you see it at, the, you know, at, at you know, presidential level, but also at, at small nonprofits. And, and we're seeing that in a lot of places now. 
with Planned Parenthood's organizing, with um, the organizing that just happened on some of the local elections. Um, like I, I talked about this, uh, we now have 15 states that have um, uh, legalized gay marriage, and we've got 35 more to go. And we're going to keep doing the organizing that it takes on the ground. And I think what we saw in Illinois was a, a, a good organizing uh, campaign on the ground that really pressured the legislature to do what was right. Jeremy, you talked about refugee uh, Sorry, Jeremy, you talked before in your answer about refugees in Australia, um, about uh, telling stories and how that's um, been. Uh, a transformative part of the campaign about aggression in the states, and um, I think that was a, a really insightful addition. Um, you know, in Australia, a nation of immigrants, um, I think we as progressives have have often stopped telling stories um, about our values, about immigration, and why that matters. We've started talking about um, policies, and we've started talking about um, uh, you know, push and pull factors, and so forth, much more than we talk about. Um, our values and our stories as, as people who've come here as immigrants. And, um, you know, Jared McKenna is in the audience today. I think he's speaking um, in this afternoon's plenary. And, and I think um, he and many others who are here are really good examples of, of changing that narrative by telling stories that connect himself and us and now. Dave, did you want to comment on this about your experience? Of Using the, the community level and the, perhaps the personal stories about getting, getting a great best message out. Well, look, I think um, I think I actually want to come back from the question sort of upper level in a way um, because I think it, stories are really crucial, but in a way we want to ask stories about about what. And I think, in a sense, the question I'd ask for, for all of us here today is to reflect back that question of, of why are we actually. Because there is a tendency, I think, to imagine that there is such a thing as a progressive movement and that we're all progressives. But I'm, I'm bothered by something Richard Dennis said a while ago. I mean, there is much that Richard says that is bothersome in a very productive way. Good on you, Richard, wherever you are. Now. And what Richard said on this occasion to me was that if you go into a room with a group of business people, they will not sit there trying to persuade each other that car manufacturing is best or, you know, there's nothing like well, the tourist industry. Business doesn't do that. Business talks about a set of common objectives and we know what they are, we hear them all the time. Let's reduce regulation, let's cut unfair dismissal, let's reduce the corporate tax burden. And I think it does really fall upon us as, as a progressive community, if we imagine ourselves as a progressive community, to try and think through what are our set of equivalents? What are the things that, that matter to us, foundationally, that provide our common, the, the common conditions that we need for a true democratic function? And I, and I think that will get us to the questions that were really raised by Richard Wilkinson yesterday morning, that this is not about a set of marketing. This is about a set of fundamental transformations that we want to see. And so I don't know what the answer is to the, to the, to the question of the, the common conditions, but, but let's have a few guesses. Let's say that actually we think taxation is good, chipping in as Miriam described it yesterday. Let's say that we need reliable, independent Australian institutions. Let's say that we need people to have the time and space to be able to lead lives where they can participate in a flourishing democracy to lead good lives. Let's say that we need the biological conditions for life to flourish. All these things are things I think that are foundational to democratic flourishing. Let's say that we need responsible, transparent government, that we need business honesty and greater business accountability. These kinds of things, I think, provide a foundation for us that we can all share and that transcend our collective issues. And I fear that if we don't have that sort of platform, that we end up in government, but never in power. So your message, David, was one also that Tim Costello talked about yesterday, that we never think about ourselves. I mean, we talk about government being siloed, but the non-profit sector being siloed. Yet as a collective, 
we are a very powerful force with the, the number of people involved, the amount of money that, that goes into our organisations. So, how do you see that that would work? What are the steps that we take away from today and how do we begin by starting to work together in this way? Well, look, I think, um, I think the, in a sense, to put, put my uh, money where my mouth is, um, I'm looking for people to personally, and my organisation, we're looking for people to work with on what are the conditions of our democratic flourishing. Um, and I think we need to start having that open conversation and not imagining that, that we can do it all at a sort of tertiary level of just mechanics. You know, this is not a conversation about machinery. Um, this is a matter of a fundamental contest of ideas. And I think if we see it as a fundamental contest of ideas, we need to name the idea, or the single great idea that I think that we are in contest with. And that is the idea that the sum total of our existence can be rendered as a set of things that are amenable to the market. If I can tell a brief story, if that, that's okay. In the last, um, in the last uh, uh, 14 months of my life, uh, I've sat at two very important bedsides. And one of those bedsides was for the birth of my second daughter, um, uh, Rachel who I love dearly and who is in Melbourne but not here um, because there's no childcare facilities at this conference. <laughs> um, and, then, <laughs> and the second bedside I sat at a month ago was the bedside of my mother as she died. Now these are the most intimate things there are to me. And these are things that should, in my view, be beyond the market. I don't want care of children, care of those who are being born, care of the dying, care of us when we are at our most vulnerable, to be subject to commodification. Just as I don't want the natural world to be the subject of commodification. Because there are some things that should be beyond the market. And we need bulwarks against the market. And I'm afraid I don't believe that we can achieve bulwarks against the market by internalising the language and the logic of neoliberalism. I simply don't believe that to be the case. I believe we need to be building up institutions, public institutions, reliable institutions, private institutions that are embedded in society, and that they provide us with the bulwark that we need against a, a market that is itself flourishing but serving people and within democratic limits. Yes, certainly, um, I'm, um, Jeremy knows that he is um, one of the main highlights of the conference for me, but I have to say from yesterday, hearing Richard's um, presentation was uh, so defining for me, but uh, also very disappointing that I think on every one of those charts, um, we were in the worst quadrant that we could be, I mean, really second or third behind the US or the UK, and I think, you know, as a society, is that really where we want to be? Where, how do we move those data points, really? And I think, and thank you to Richard, and I would love your slides to share around if it's possible. Link on the website coming up. So uh, that's great. So we're saying, um, David, you talked about that's your idea for the future. Louise, your one big thing to come out of, but perhaps what, if the one thing that we are to fight for as a collective going forward, what is that for you and some ideas about how, what are the next steps that we might do to, to realise that idea? Well, I just want to echo everything that David said. Um, I think very articulate and absolutely spot on. I think we're in a really significant values war uh, in this country and I don't think our values um, are winning. Uh, and I think that, um, so we need to, and I think Tim Costello talked yesterday about the need to reassert values, but also a shared narrative, a shared language around those values. I think we're pretty poor at that, and I know that that was part of the rationale for the inception of the Centre for Australian Progress, actually, because um, so many disparate groups felt like we didn't have a common language. And But I think it's just really the tip of the iceberg, and I guess, at the end of the day, what we're seeing in Australia is a significant shift in both wealth and power uh, to a very small and powerful elite. Uh, 
And so all of us, I think, it doesn't matter whether we're in health advocacy, whether we're in online campaigning, whether we're in Indigenous um, uh, rights area, whatever our little patch of land, I think all of us um, are fighting in our own silos and most of us are actually not winning. And I think we are, you know, we shouldn't be in this room if we're not about winning. You know, Jeremy's spot on. None of us are here to be tryhards, to be, you know, exhausted uh, organisers. We're actually here to change the world. And I guess within our own union, we cover a lot of um, people who work really hard and provide really critical services to just making our society and our economy tick over. And yet the level of disrespect and degradation of work um, that we've seen in recent years, it just is not talked about. Uh, and the stories that our members tell, the stories that Sam talks about, and we've, I think, got a booklet to share with people today, just really, I think, are quite appalling that in, you know, when Credit Suisse says we're the most prosperous country in the world, to have hard-working Australians um, not able to heat their homes in winter, not able to have children because they can't afford it, they're putting it off, that they can't afford to pay um, to take their kids to a doctor when they're sick because there's no bulk billing GP and the queue at the local outpatients is too long. You know, these just are daily stories that our members are talking about. They're real, real stories about real people, but they're not on our political agenda. And so how do we, how do we both tell that story but build a movement that's driven by the passion and the injustice but also with a vision of hope? Because that's what I think we lack, is that compelling vision of hope. And so I think, you know, we can say all that, but where does the rubber hit the road? And we've been having a really interesting dialogue in our union with our members about this. And so we've been talking to, um, we've just had a conversation with 26,000 of our members about what they want in their lives for them and their families. And it's been a fantastic experience and very confronting. And out of that, um, bizarrely, we've come up with um, a million things. We can't afford a home, we can't have a family, we can't have access to healthcare, all these things that I've talked about. And what we've decided is that we can com campaign on each of those, but where does redistribution really happen? Where does that power transfer happen? It happens at the bargaining table, and every single right we've got to actually try and wrest something back from profits into wages is being contested. So yes, we've got to do that as a union. But I think as a progressive force, the other piece where redistribution absolutely happens is through the taxation system. And increasingly that's becoming, instead of a proxy for society and all the sorts of things that we stand for, it's becoming a proxy for business to how to minimise the impact on them uh, and it's all about their influence. And so we're seeing, you know, the real debate on tax moving to consumption, to regressive taxes, to taxing lower and middle income earners, but letting off people whose income comes from property and wealth and all the other sorts of um, uh, capacities that wealthy individuals and businesses have. So if we don't win the fight about tax, it's the proxy for what is the state, what is, and the state is the proxy for what are we as a community and a society. So it's a boring as hell issue, <laughs> and we're really worried about how we make this exciting and engage our members around it, but we know they want good health care, we know that our members want to be able to afford a home and, and not be in a speculative bubble where they can never get into that. They want good aged care, they want good uh, early childhood education and care, they want the workers in those sectors, yes, our members, to be well paid. Uh, and so the only way all those things are going to happen for us and for all the other groups in this room is to have a just tax system that actually acknowledges that we are a society first. We've got to pay for that, but more importantly, business has to step up and pay for that and pay some level of responsibility to a common good and a better life. to what David is saying about the commodification is and I often wonder myself, you know, should we be making a profit for caring for people, caring for old people, 
caring for children, care, you know, does, are these profit-making businesses? Because the moment that care needs humans, not databases, not websites to get care, that needs care, and uh, people need to be paid so they give good care. And uh, I think perhaps one of the poster boys for your tax campaign might be Rob Moody, who was on our health panel yesterday, and he started by saying, he got his local rate notice and was so happy he had his photo taken with it because he said, I know that I'm buying stuff. I'm buying great stuff for my community. This was a happy moment for him. So he could be a good poster for you. So Sam, over to you. What's the one thing you think we need and how do we go about getting it? Uh, well, I'd agree with my, my comrades here and um, let's deconstruct um, the capital system and, and all that. Um, Just a small chance. But um, and, you know, this is, this is a, a, a much more specific um, thing, and perhaps um, um, won't resonate as much with, with this audience. But I think it's off the agenda for a lot of us, and, um, and it'll be very important over the next couple of years. Um, I think that we're looking at a couple of years ahead, where um, the, the basic um, the basics of our democracy that allow all of us to work as campaigners. Uh, will come under attack. Um, the, you know, we're listening to Jeremy talking about getting out the vote and how much work goes into um, to, <laughs> to going and knocking on people's doors to, to bring them out to actually cast a vote um, reminds me every time um, how incredibly fortunate we are to live um, in a country which has um, the, the proudest record in the world, I believe, of, um, of franchise, um, of, you know, um, Recognising women's franchise um, early, of recognising indigenous franchise much too late, um, but of compulsory voting um, and of extremely high rates of voting and, um, and relatively high rates of indigenous voting um, for the world. Um, but th this is a government that we're looking at now who will attack that, um, and in quiet and insidious ways. Uh, in 2006, um, they. Uh, the Howard government, its um, strategists will, uh, have already started working on their new plans now, um, removed the vote from more than half a million Australians silently without anybody um, much noticing. Um, they've already flagged um, you know, changes to protect the integrity of our electoral roll again um, by requiring people to, to bring photo ID to, to booths. Um, we know that more than two-thirds of Indigenous voters don't have that kind of ID. Um, we, they've already flagged um, in the last couple of years moves to um, require people to vote at their local booths rather than being able to vote mo um, in a mobile way, which we know um, will, would disenfranchise untold about hundreds of thousands of, of um, particularly working people. Um, and this, this will definitely come at us in the next couple of years. Uh, also under attack will be um, our ability, everybody in this room, to organise, to mobilise um, and to coordinate our voices during election cycles. Um, we've seen in Canada and in the UK in the last uh, two years um, very, very similar legislation, it almost seems like there's a conspiracy going on, um, to, um, to attack the ability of, of unions and of NGOs to campaign during electoral cycles. Um, in the UK, um, they've just delayed laws um, that um, that would have prevented, for example, David and I, um, as you know, in our organisations, um, spending money in the six months before an election cycle um, but beyond a, a very small cap, um, while allowing uh, huge businesses um, and indeed um, you know, billionaires who would like to see themselves inside the um, Parliament House um, to spend as much as they want. Um, now, I, I have no doubt that a kind of similar raft of changes is coming here, um, and it's a tragedy of the common situation where all of us will be um, hugely affected, um, but none of us um, aware of have the explicit job of preventing that. Um, that's part of the reason that I'm uh, very proud to be a small part of Australian progress, I think, um, is through uh, these get-togethers and, and through um, Australian progress's continued coordination that we can fight. Jeremy, you're one big thing. Well, I, I can't, I can't.
can't help but hear the conversation about voting rights and, and say, you know, um, I, I think that what you're getting at is you're exactly right. You need to know and be uh, um, in front of the curve on what's going to come because it is a tough time, and a lot of what you all fight for every day is going to be under attack in a lot of different in a lot of different ways. And I think you got to be I think you got to be really clear eyed about that. Um, Conservatives across the world, you know, these things, these are laws that, that happen in Canada and other places that they're, you know, moving around. It's not happening in a silo. It's not sort of, um, it's not organic. Um, and so you need to know these kinds of things that are happening. There's, no, there's nothing more um, uh, problematic than threats to the franchise and than threats to, you know, voting rights in a country where we're, we're only getting 60% turnout and that's seen as a success historically. Um, in the presidential year, and 40% in the non-presidential year, um, the, the, these things, voting, you know, voter ID and other things, are not designed to help the integrity of the process. Uh, and so, whether it's on that issue or other issues, I think everybody needs to be clear-eyed about what's moving forward and how do you get in front of the curve on that and be ready to fight back with the right messaging and with the right machinery to get that messaging to enough people to make a difference. Um, and I think that takes conferences like this, where you're all coming together and sharing ideas. It takes investment in training institutions and, and, and tables where people are coming around and not just talking about kind of lofty ideas, but talking about specific concrete ideas to stop what will be a, a, an attack on, on your values and, and how you do that. So um, be, be honest about it and then, and then go figure out how to get in front of it because um, you know, they, will, they have a set of priorities that they're lining up that they would like to get you know, pass on all different issues that will affect everybody on the stage and everybody in the audience. So, um, knowing about that and being uh, aggressive and in front of it is really important. Okay. Okay. Um, so, that's a good lead in to uh, Louise is hosting a lunchtime session today uh, about launching a Real Voices for Change platform. And I think that is. Uh, just as an opportunity for Louise to talk a bit about that before the lunchtime session for people to come along. Thank you. Um, we, um, uh, I guess, out of our um, work with our membership and trying to think through where we take this much broader agenda, um, this is not about a traditional bargaining strategy or even an industry campaign. This is actually a much bigger fight that we think we need to be a part of. But we're also very um, conscious of what's we're very ambitious union. We also know that we're very uh, limited in terms of our capacity to win a major fight on values and much less taxation. So we are really keen to try and bring as many people together as possible with our members to work on this campaign. And so today we want to launch um, the latter part of the lunch break, so you get to have some lunch, but then come and join us. We've got some of our Real Voices members coming to talk about their stories, um, but we'd also like people here and in your organisations and beyond to really join with us. And we're launching today Progressive Voice. It's a meeting place for all of us to come together to think through how do we really re-engage our values, reassert them and work together, particularly around issues like the role of the state, the sort of services it should be able to provide and the money required to actually give us all a good life and a good society. So Progressive Voice, um, last half of the lunch time, I'm sure it's on your agenda somewhere, so please come and meet some of our members uh, and be part of a much broader coalition. <coughs> It's in the program, so you know where to go. So as a wrap-up then, we're saying, what is the long-term vision, Richard Wilkinson talked about this morning, with what is the transformative change that we need that's going to move Australia from that bottom quadrant up to Norway so that we all don't have to emigrate to Norway, that we can be up there in the top quadrant, um, protecting our fundamental democratic right to be able to have our say and vote. And really, I think, pay our way that everybody pays and it's a fair payment system, I think is a great, great way forward. And uh, we're very uh, privileged to have Jeremy here with his expertise and I've learned an enormous amount out of his presentation and, and that for the today. I'm sure he's going to be very much joining your Real Voices um, movement and he'll be on the database and we'll be knocking on his door and doing all those things and uh, talking to him about joining our cause and we'll have a fan here in Australia. Okay. So thank you to you all. Thank you.